What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And then this Monday, the third week of Lent, we're continuing on through the Gospel of Mark, this time uh, beginning in chapter 9. And of course, we have a quote from an ancient church father, as well as our Lenten catechesis, which will now be focusing on the Lord's Prayer. Hopefully, you stick around. <music> So for a little bit of context, uh, because I don't do this on Saturday and Sunday, one of the things that we missed, and I would encourage you to go back and read it, is the transfiguration of our Lord. So Jesus reveals his full divinity to a chosen few at the Mount of Transfiguration. And of course, Moses and Elijah are there and they're discussing Jesus's exodus, which will soon be happening. And now they're coming back down the mountain. So this is where we are. In our gospel reading, we're in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it often casts him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are permissible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And then Jesus saw that a crowd came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out of the boy, and it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. Eyes on the prize. I think that's fair to say uh, of Jesus as we've been going through this Gospel of Mark. And of course, for the season of Lent, it might seem weird to spend so much time going through the Gospels and watching these miracles and these teachings and these healings and these casting out of demons. We're supposed to be focusing on Lent, on the cross. But what we've come to see about Jesus is that he has not taken his eyes off of the end game. His goal, his mission, his purpose, the reason that he came was to suffer and to die and to rise again. And as many times as he tells his disciples, this is the plan, they either don't get it or flat out rebuke him. So whatever troubles, whatever trials, whatever torments, and certainly uh, there are those that we are facing or seemingly facing this day. God's focus, his plan, his purpose is the suffering, death, and resurrection so that whatever ills befall us, whether Jesus heal us or not, he has prepared a place for us in his suffering, death, and resurrection. As he said, I go to prepare a place for you. This is the comfort, the confidence, and the assurance that we have as Christians throughout this season of Lent and in and, and all times, that Jesus has prepared a place for us by bearing in his own flesh our sin 
and being our Savior. So now we turn to the writings of Martin Luther, the great Lutheran reformer. When you cast your sins from yourself and onto Christ, when you firmly believe that his wounds and sufferings are your sins, to be born and paid for by him, as we read in Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. St. Peter says, In his body he has borne our sins on the wood of the cross, 1 Peter 2.24. St. Paul says, God has made him a sinner for us, so that through him we would be made just, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You must stake everything on these and similar verses. The more your conscience torments you, the more tenaciously must you cling to them. If you do not do that, but presume to still your conscience with your contrition and penance, you will never obtain peace of mind, but will have to despair in the end. If we allow sin to remain in our conscience and try to deal with it there, or if we look at sin in our heart, it will, much, it will be much too strong for us and will live on forever. But if we behold it resting on Christ and see it overcome by his resurrection, and then boldly believe this, even it is dead and nullified. Sin cannot remain on Christ, since it is swallowed up by his resurrection. This is the main thing. Not miraculous healings, not miraculous signs, not miraculous wonders, not safety, not immunity from anything that's happening in this world, be it plague or pestilence or war or famine or bloodshed. The conscience the assurance of the forgiveness of sins, the assurance and confidence to know that while we walk through this veil of tears, Christ has made a way for us, and we cling to the promises of the word of God that are indeed for us, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Keep your sins where they belong. Keep them on Christ so that you can walk free, because when you keep them on Christ, by faith you know his resurrection has overcome death. Now, for our Lenten catechesis, uh, we've gone through the Ten Commandments, we've gone through the Apostles' Creed, now we focus on the Lord's Prayer. So we focus now, today, this Monday in the third week of Lent, on the first petition. Our Father, who art in heaven. No person can perfectly keep the Ten Commandments even though he has begun to believe. The devil, with all his power, together with the world and our own flesh, resists our efforts. Therefore, nothing is more necessary than that we should continually turn towards God's ear, call upon him, and pray to him. We must pray that he would give, preserve, and increase faith in us and the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3 We pray that he would remove everything that is in our way and that opposes us in these matters, so that we might know what and how to pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ has himself taught us both the way and the words. Luke 11, 1-4, as we shall see. The second petition. Hallowed be thy name. God's name should have its proper honor. It should be valued holy and granted as the greatest treasure and holy thing that we have. As godly children, we should pray that God's name, which is already holy in heaven, may also be and remain holy with us upon earth and in all the world. In this petition, we pray for exactly what God demands in the second commandment. We pray that his name not be taken in vain to swear, curse, lie, deceive, or so on, but use well for God's praise and honor. For whoever uses God's name for any sort of wrong profanes and desecrates this holy name. This point is easy and clear if the language is understood. To hallow means the same as to praise, magnify, and honor, both in word and deed. We should pray for ourselves who have God's word but are not thankful for it, nor live like we ought according to the word. If you pray for this with your heart, you can be sure that it pleases God. For he will not hear anything more dear to him than that his honor and praise is exalted above everything else and that his word is taught in purity and is considered precious and dear. We pray. 
Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need. Continue to preserve your church in safety. Govern her by your goodness and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.